All right, so I'm Casey Raymond. Um, I've coordinated the faculty fellows the last two years. Um, Emily Bouvier is taking over. She's going to run them next year. Um, and this session is really about giving all of you an opportunity to hear what last year's fellows did, what they learned, their experiences, and then for you all to ask them questions. Um, either because you're going to be a fellow next year or you're interested potentially being a fellow in subsequent years. It does look like, although there's no promises at this point, that there will be another round of fellows in the 2025 calendar year. And just briefly, the fellows program runs on a calendar year basis because our goal is that the incoming fellows have some training now during winter breakouts. They have spring semester to meet with each other and the coordinator and really work out uh, their knowledge base, things they need to know, things they need to work on with a goal to improve the accessibility of one of their courses. And so they get that release time during spring semester to spend that time working those elements out. They have the summer to work on it a little bit more with the goal then so they're deploying that new course in the fall and we have meetings to see how it's going and troubleshoot and so forth and then report out at the next winter breakout session. Um, so that's how it, it works and that's part of the reason it's off the academic calendar and it runs on a, the regular calendar. Right. And so what I want to do is go through and have each of the fellows introduce themselves and kind of um, talk about why they were interested in accessibility in the fellows project. All right. We've got two online and we have two here uh, in person. So um, let's start with Eve in Zoom. Okay, I don't think I'm muted, for it probably is the first time ever being on Zoom. I'm not muted and talking. Um, I'm Eve Clark Benavides. I am a professor and chair of the sociology department. Um, I have been interested in accessibility since I started teaching. Um, I had started um, sort of traditionally where I had deaf students and I was showing a lot of films. And of course, this was before the technology. And so captions was an issue and things like that. So this has been in the back of my head for many years. Um, but it really became apparent the importance of digital accessibility. Uh, I'm a senator. I, I was a Senate uh, senator in the SUNY system uh, for Oswego for about six years. And one of the sessions that uh, meetings that we went to really focused on the importance of accessibility. So I've been doing sort of piecemealing things together. And when I saw the fellowship program, I thought this would be a very a much more organized, structured way at, to help me get better at instead of just the sort of ad hoc things I was doing. Um, sociology doesn't have as many of the issues as some of the other social sciences. We do do things with charts and things like that. But most of our problems are related to sort of reading materials and how to get them accessible. So I really wanted to focus on that aspect. Thanks, Yiro. Uh, Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yiro Wen. I'm a fifth year um, assistant professor of marketing um, at SUNY Oswego. So um, my, my original intention is trying to improve my teaching online. And um, um, I have already, I think myself as, has already did a lot in terms of the accessibility thing. And um, I just want to make sure that I don't have any, you know, missing points. But from the past semester or past uh, past academic year, um, I find a lot of holes in my own preparation of my course materials. I think this is a very good experience, an educative experience for myself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Crystal? Hello, uh, my name is Crystal Kennel, and I'm the uh, I'm an associate professor and chair of the theater department. And um, as has been previously said, I've always been aware of needing to make my teaching more accessible. And as a theater artist, and we tend to uh, pride ourselves on being inclusive, but that doesn't always mean accessible, which is one thing that I appreciate about this program and how it made that distinction. And so it was important to me to uh, find ways to make 
uh, the play reading experience more accessible, the play watching experience more accessible for our students. Uh, and then also with the transition to SUNY Oswego, the idea of teaching non-majors and how to make the theater more accessible overall to um, all students. And um, as Eve mentioned, the structure of the fellows um, program was very helpful um, in terms of a good way of moving forward with this desire to learn more about accessibility. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so I'm from Vital Okanagan. I'm from Biological Sciences. Um, I teach online courses since uh, four years now. And previously, when I was uh, working on my course materials, I was mostly concentrating on the content and the quality of the content and what information um, was provided to the students. Uh, but I was not aware of the accessibility uh, part of it and until I had a student in my class uh, who was partially um, um, visually impaired. So I I did pretty much work on all my documents by sitting, I mean, I was in the formative the student instead of making my uh, materials accessible. So then I realized uh, um, the, the significance and the importance of making those digital contents really accessible to everyone, not just accommodating one or two students. Um, so then I was looking into all the resources uh, and I found out about the program. Um, the program has really helped me to <clears throat> start from the basics. Uh, pretty much I was looking for uh, resources to help me to design, um, uh, revise all the materials I have posted so far. So I thought it was all perfect, but it was not. So, um, so, so I'm just working one by one, one step at a time. So one course at a time. So now at least I know the basics of following the five principles. So my students will be all getting the same learning experience. So I'm really thankful for the program. And I'll just add that it brings up a good point. Yeah. And I stated earlier that the goal is to make your courses more accessible. I mean, the ultimate goal is they're perfect. Mm -hmm. It's not always realistic, right? Uh, but there's a lot of small things that we can do that have huge improvements. And that's really what all the accessibility trainings throughout this week and that the work group has done over the years and that the fellows program is about is learning the simple steps and start building towards it. And um, as some of you might encounter, um, discipline-specific challenges. Okay. So uh, let's kind of, nobody's jumping out with questions online in the room. So for the fellows, what discipline-specific challenges did you encounter? And were you successful in kind of Overcoming them, or is it still something we're working on? Um, so I can start. Cool. <clears throat> so as I said, I'm from biological sciences. So most of um, the data or the content I'm presenting to the students, especially for my lab courses, are completely the figures and graphs and mostly like schematic flowcharts. Uh, I will say I'm not 100% um, sure that I made materials all accessible because we have several challenges when it comes to complex um, uh, figures, It's uh, especially when it uh, has multiple staining procedures and other things, so the colors need to be distributed and they need to be having an alternative text for that. Um, I, I have tried my best to do it, but I could say uh, I can still work on it. Um, so there are some things which couldn't be done at present, but I'm going to keep working on it. Um, so at least it's better, or I can update it. Okay. Right. Thank you. Others? Uh, um, I uh, had, I uh, one of the big things that I ran into early in my journey with accessibility had to do with this sort of what I saw as a contradiction between giving free materials to students through PDF scans, you know, because uh, readings can get expensive. So a lot of times I would copy and then give out, you know, sheets of articles or whatever else. And uh, the start of the fellows, uh, my start on this journey, PDFs were a nightmare. <laughs> 
and getting them accessible was just very daunting. And it continued when I started as a fellow because the first breakout session about how to get PDFs accessible, I thought I was going to cry, to be honest. I was like, this is going to take hours and effort that I don't have in addition to all my teaching. So my first reaction was, I'm going to get rid of all of that. But that is really challenging because there's a lot of extra readings I give students that are really helpful. Um, but because of our migration to Brightspace, uh, during that first session, it was discovered that actually, if you have scanned documents, um, uh, Brightspace has a tool that can help you in the process of converting PDFs to more accessible. Um, and that sort of changed the whole game for me because I didn't want to sacrifice getting my students free information and supplements that I think are really important at the, at the expense of having things that are really accessible. So um, that was my journey. And But there's still a lot of obstacles. I mean, Brightspace really helps with some of the tools to get started. But I think the big challenge and the dauntingness, which is sort of what um, we've heard already, is that you never have a perfect document and there's always more to do to make it more accessible. And it is a lot of tinkering with things and having the headspace and the energy to do that can sometimes be daunting. So I think Casey's point about you're never an expert at this, you're never completed at this, there's always new tools that come out. Um, is a good way to think about it because it's just there's always a new task to do. But I did have a breakthrough pretty early on last year, um, and I found that a, most of my documents, unlike some of the other fellows who ran into challenges, actually were convertible so that I could use them in an accessible way. Um, I'm going to go ahead and piggyback off of Eve because uh, the idea of the PDFs and the struggle it is, I feel bad for Casey because I feel I bring this up every time I talk to him. Um, <laughs> but uh, in terms of um, area specific, the play scripts have a very specific formatting. And so while I could, and like Eve, um, I was con concerned about cost asking our students to buy uh, the number of textbooks and play scripts and things. And so I, you know, years ago, I did the copy and allow the students to use that. But of course, that isn't accessible. And so the main struggle for me was primarily getting the formatting correct to uh, to help it read uh, clearly through uh, the PDF. Uh, and so making the PDF more accessible. And so that was my sort of industry area specific struggle, um, as well as finding videos of play like, performances that would have captioning and other uh, accessible tools available to them. And so through this program, I did, I got better, I did get better, but um, I did not get as good as I could. Um, and so I know I have a lot of work to do, but I am excited about the opportunity to continue to convert uh, my PDF scripts to make them more accessible. And then in speaking with uh, Casey and the other fellows, the idea of um, ha finding resources on campus that can help hopefully streamline the process and help you, like like you said, through Brightspace to make, uh, to at least make start with the PDF and start to make it a little bit more easily accessible and then go back through and fine tune it. And so that will be what I will be working on for a good number of years. <laughs> Ira, do you have anything you wanted to share? Uh, yes, um, actually, I, I personally thought that my preparation in terms of in terms of online teaching was very accessible none of my students was talking or complaining about any of inaccessible kind of materials I provided but after I joined the program I find that you know I can do more I can do more to uh, further polish the the work <clears throat> that um that I pro uh, prepared for my teaching materials for example um, other than just show a pie chart, I can actually mark and label more by adding more texts that could provide the students with, you know, um, with certain uncertain with uncertainties um, 
and color blindness, um, like vision impairs, um, to see the the information better to help their understanding and their <clears throat> absorption of the information I would like to provide. And um, uh, on top of that, I am so lucky that I'm not one of the finance professors who is in charge to present a lot of like complex, more complex line charts. Because um, during one session, I, I brought up those um, complex materials um, and the one of the um, the the um, the the suggestions I received is just to show the um, the general kind of information by adding more contact uh, by adding more texts as the instructions for the students. But if there is you know a lot of complexities in the reflection of this of this um, figure, then um, there might be there not there might not be existing tools to help the instructors to reflect every little details as they want. So that needs more work. So um, after that session, I feel that um, I I could do I could do way more um, than what I what I'm uh, what I'm currently working on. So yeah, I'm actually in the process of revamping most of my. Um, available um, teaching materials to um, help myself improve. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Thank you, Tech. Two audiences. But... I can jump in and ask a question for the fellows. Um, just in terms of advice that you might give to the current group of fellows, any pointers, um, things you wish you had known going into it, something that you took away from it that you didn't necessarily expect, just something that you want to um, to say to the fellows of 2024 who are all here virtually, um, Ashley, Sue, and Amy are the 2024 fellows. I would start out with just be patient because you get a lot of information and you and it's kind of shell shocking to be like, oh, I've never thought about color before. And am I bolding too much and all of that? And there's this is very detail oriented. I am not a particularly great detail oriented person, which is always shocking to me for some of the stuff I do, which is very detail oriented. And so I think my going in is I thought, I think like uh, some of the other fellows have talked about, I thought I was already on the path to accessibility. And then I just realized the sort of Pandora box that gets opened. And that can be kind of intimidating. And sometimes when I get intimidating, I pull back and then I don't start with the baby step. So I guess my advice would be just you're going to get a lot of information and you'll be like, wow, I never thought about that before. And um, don't shy away from it. Just know that this is incremental and that you start with the baby steps and that you're only focusing on one course, which I think makes it a lot better. Um, and just start with, you know, maybe thinking about what I wish I had done is I wish I would have had more specific goals mapped out at the beginning, because I think that that would have helped me get over that initial, oh, this is a wow kind of feeling. I have a second Eve. Um, so when I attended the workshops last winter, um, I was thinking it's going to be like mountain time work for my core materials because it's too much and I was not sure like how I'm going to do it. Uh, but after um, attending each and every session specifically on um, um, course preparation and, and using all the um, software is available. So my advice would be maybe I, I would call it a suggestion. Sorry. So my suggestion will be to uh, just take bits and pieces of the course you are going to revise and then try to put the uh, document after attending the workshop and have that as an example for um, uh, the coordinator. So you could we could just go over the samples during the session. So in that way, it's easy to learn more. At the same time, when we have an example, 
uh, it is useful for all the other fellows as well to see the challenges because it's going to be, well, the challenges are going to be field specific really. So if you already have a sample prepared in advance before the meeting, it, uh, it will really help. Um, so we did that. Uh, during our sessions this year, and Casey helped me to figure out some of the specific challenges I'm going through uh, with my documents. And same thing happened to uh, Emily and other uh, fellows as well. So it's really helpful. So uh, it looks like it's a lot, but it is not. Uh, once you finish uh, the program, uh, obviously, you won't be making anything without having the styles players in Word or Google Docs. So it's going to be okay. Um, something that I would say, um, I could absolutely, I absolutely echo everything even Kuhn says. So, um, something I did was I was more transparent with my students in the classes for the course I was working on and sort of explained, you know, why, why I did certain, why I made certain choices and, um, allowed them. And, and I think that really opened up the class to a more of a sort of a conversation and a re relationship. And I found just in this specific class that I was working with that students were more, they seemed more open to discuss, you know, concerns they had or things they needed. And so I, and I started day one. And so that it's a little tangential to accessibility, but it also, you know, we had a conversation about the syllabus and how, and so it was really entering into that relationship with them. And I think it really set the tone for the rest of the semester that, you know, they knew their learning was important to me and how they learned was important. And so I, I think they felt that we could really collaborate on what works best for them. And so I found that very helpful. Erin, did you have a suggestion you wanted to share or advice? Um, I personally don't. I just agree with all my colleagues on my peers' um, suggestions and uh, advices. All right, thank you. And I just kind of piggyback the as we've said, it can be overwhelming, right? And this is one of the things we've done with the fellows. We try to do with all the breakout sessions is pick the small things, start simple. But also part of the reason it's overwhelming and we show you these things and we've got the five principles to highlight it is to get you aware. You might not be ready to correct it, but you're aware that it could be a problem. And as Crystal mentioned and, you know, introducing this to your students, even making them aware of some of the tools in Brightspace or wherever that, hey, the document could be read to you and so forth. Some of them don't even realize these are options. Mm -hmm. You know, the common thing I make say to them is, hey, when you're walking across campus, you could have whatever read to you. Most of them just look at me like, why would I want to do that? <laughs> but there might be that one student in the class that's like, oh, never thought about that. Right. And so having them aware of accessibility and some of the components actually can help them when they don't even realize it might be helpful. So that's part of the reason that we try and introduce the broad spectrum. Um, to answer Amy's question, um, our goal is to get the 2024 fellows together with the 2023 fellows to sort of chat beyond this. Um, we haven't quite pin down when that's going to happen. But for the 2023 fellows, you got something to think about to see if you can come up with um, some examples of what you sort of changed in your course, what you liked and so forth. All right. And Tyrion asked, you all talked about how to incorporate, co incorporate accessibility efforts into your courses and the opportunities and challenges. During the semester, have you found any successes or barriers with sharing your expertise with faculty and staff in your department or school? I think that's a really good question um, because I think that is part of the goals of being a fellow is how you're gonna disseminate information to others. And uh, Casey just mentioned, and I really struck home to me is a lot of times when you start talking about this with colleagues, you get the eye roll, you get the, sighing. And I think, you know, especially after COVID, I think people are really feeling kind of pressured about teaching in general. So um, 
I have noticed though that um, there is more of an openness to this, I think now than there was. I think that has happened because of the tech changes. So when I talk to my colleagues about, oh, well, I thought I was gonna, it was gonna be so challenging to do a PDF, but oh, wow. The one good thing about me having to do all that Brightspace work is I found that there were more tools to be helpful. And so it's not as big of a mountain to climb as I thought. And that seems to open up dialogue a little bit more. Um, but yeah, having, um, I think that that's always a challenge is how, how do you get, you know, you, you get this small victory. How do you share that in a way that gets more people on board? And I think um, I am thinking about that. I don't know that I have the answer to it. Um, so just to follow what Eve said, um, so I did have one-on-one -on -one interaction with some of my colleagues who approached me um, when we were working with the course materials, especially for the manuals. Uh, but other than that, based on the feedback provided, what I did is I tried to make a document because they were just looking at specific um, video tutorials or maybe like a written document which could help them to make their course materials when they're working. Um, so I try to make a document with specific links to the general software we use in our department. So I've shared that with the whole department so that everyone have that material in mean, a document handy in case they want to work on board, they can make go and check which video to watch out. So we have tons of resources available in our web page. So this one will be handy just for them to not search, just go ahead and look what they want. And also, uh, I add a little bit about the fellow program. So hopefully we might have some people from our department join us soon. Um, I would just comment in terms of the faculty and staff in the Department of Theater were very open to it, um, but they, because of course we have our courses, but also we have our public presentations. and. Uh, Interestingly enough, and I don't know, how, like, I don't think I particularly championed it. Maybe it was more like subconscious or something, but I had um, a number of faculty be interested in improving the accessibility of our productions through maybe operate, having a more regular, you know, ASL interpreted per, uh, performances and stuff. And so that was very rewarding. Um, I think we're very much in the sort of brainstorming phase about what we can do, but what has been nice for me this past year is for folks within my department to see that we can do better. Um, and so that's been very exciting. And I'm gonna jump in and just kind of add one of the things that I thought about, and it's going to show up in various components of the Brightspace course that we're developing. and. A key thing is to get the idea of accessibility to click and to resonate with people. Right. And if they don't have a disability or they haven't used an accessible format prior, or they don't think about what assistive technology is, how do you relate to that? With the students, this won't work today in most cases, I know. But one example that has occurred to me is how many people listen to music on a music player now and you're like, oh, I don't want that song, skip. Right to the next one, skip. How in the world did you do that on a record? Ready? You, you, there was not a clear, easy way you could just skip to the next track or a cassette tape. Right? That's an example of assistive technology. The beginning and the end of the musical piece are marked. And just you can readily jump from one to the next, right? And so we all anymore use versions of assistive technology, most of the time without even considering it. And so, you know, a lot of folks will be like, oh boy, I don't want to go back to those days. I don't <laughs> want to go back to that situation. And then you kind of drop in the, well, that might be what students are dealing with today if you know we don't take some steps to ensure that it works for everyone. Right? Um, and I realized Jeez. folks were talking and I said, we're all getting there and you take small steps. 
I didn't model very good appropriate behavior because I didn't self-describe myself as a middle-aged <laughs> middle-aged male currently wearing a mask just to be safe. Um, you know, so that's the other thing that I think all of us can do as we learn and progress is, is you know, model best practices. And I think Crystal's mention of theater is a good example. You know, Casey, not, I would just add to, but they're just getting there and starting to think we have to consider these things. Eve? Yeah, Casey, I would just add to that because that was one of the most compelling moments for me at the beginning of this process in the fellowship program is that so many times we think accessibility is reaching the people who have issues. But what we find actually is that this is just good teaching practices and that for every student who might have an impairment that needs the assistance, you're also actually helping your students. So I think that you had a cartoon in one of the first sessions that showed like it was a snow day and uh, there's a pair of stairs on one side, the ramp on the other, and the janitor is clearing off the steps. And one of the students notes, well, what about the people in a wheelchair? And he's like, well, I'll get to the ramp next. And then the response was, well, if you got to the ramp first, everybody would be accommodated. So the way that I think about this now, it is a lot easier, just like building a new house is always easier than remodeling old. Like if you start with some of these ideas at the beginning, it really actually isn't that much of an ask. And you find you reach all your students. You're not just giving accessibility for those who might need AIDS you're actually making it better for all of us. So like, I like to skip songs I don't wanna hear. Like that is as much of a help to me as it would be to someone who needs the technology to overcome uh, um, an accessibility problem. Emily? So yeah, just to jump in, <clears throat> excuse me, to piggyback off of Casey and Eve in terms of thinking about when you are trying to be an ambassador and convey this information to colleagues, especially if you are running up into barriers for folks who are resistant to this. Um, I think Eve and Casey both sort of highlighted that it's, it's not necessarily about disseminating the skills or resources for the skills at the start. That's a good piece of it, but it's also thinking about how can we intrinsically motivate people to start the work. Um, yes, you'll share resources about ways to make your materials accessible, but finding ways to motivate people, um, because like we've said, many of us might not have a personal relationship to the need for digital accessibility, um, but sort of what E was saying, we are all teachers. And so if you focus on the idea of like, this will help my teaching broadly, um, or, or for me personally, um, it was the idea of understanding disability as a form of diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? That, that is what resonated with me to help sort of intrinsically motivate me to engage with this. Um, it might be a struggle trying to figure out what might motivate different people. Um, I remember uh, being in a session with Jessica Rear once and she was saying, I see all the same faces at these workshops. So even the fact that you are all here right now, it's, you have that intrinsic motivation um, to at least learn more. And so then the question becomes, how do we reach the people who don't attend these sessions or who don't fill out feedback forms if we are trying to learn about barriers that people might have and wanting to engage with this work. So I'm always interested to hear from people um, about barriers that they have faced or ways that they have um, tried to uh, phrase this to folks who might be resistant. Even though I've been with this for a few years, there's always something more that I learn and ways to think about it for other folks. And that kind of dovetails into another question I have for the current fellows. What's next? Uh, what's next for you? How do you plan to be an ally for accessibility? I don't. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I actually am trying to create materials, much like some of my colleagues have already talked about, of how to like get simple steps, sort of like of common problems to my department as a way of like, oh, here's a very quick cheat sheet, because I think that that can be helpful. Um, and, and trying to like formulate as I'm doing my final report and things about how to, to, to sort of present this more widely. 
Um, and so that's kind of my first steps. Uh, for me, um, to reach out to my colleagues, yes, I have sent the first document right now. And then um, I will probably be doing a seminar, the financial seminar we do have that every other week. So I can have like a one panel based on the feedback I get now um, with my document. So I can make it more specific to address the concerns they have. Um, and for my professional development, um, so I'm actually having a winter course right now, which has been um, prepared almost following all the five principles. So I'm getting positive feedback from my students. Uh, but I'm having great challenge with other course I'll be teaching in fall next year. Um, as I said, it's basically the figures I'm struggling with. So I'm trying to fix that or at least make it more accessible. So I'm going to work during spring and maybe next summer to get that manual completely done because it's like a very big manual of like 450 pages. So hopefully I'll be I'll be there. By next fall. So that, those are the two objectives I'm working by now. Crystal Euro. Um, I can say I'm working individually with certain uh, members of my faculty in terms of like the hyperlink wording, you know, stuff like that. So it's the very simple things that we learn, um, also content types. And then as I mentioned, we're thinking more uh, about accessibility in terms of our production season for next year. Um, I wanted to check in with Casey about the DQ. I was curious if like I still wanted to do those courses. I don't know what the timeline was, of course. <laughs> so, um, and that's been, it's great to know that those resources are available through the school. And so I'm hoping to take advantage of some of those over the next year uh, in the summertime. My plan is basically to um further polish my own teaching material while when other colleagues are reaching out to for me uh, to help. Um, I will be more than happy to assist. Thank you. Thanks, Hero. <clears throat> Just to kind of follow up on Crystal's comment about DQ University, um, it's a resource that we have within that SUNY has paid for. Um. You can get registered for it. You don't sort of lose access after a finite period of time. And there are some very good resources there to think about accessibility and also how to employ or implement accessible features in content you create. All right. Um, again, the, the Brightspace course that we have coming in a couple of weeks is going to draw upon those resources as well um, and point folks that direction so that we're really steering everyone to the same common sets of resources to learn from. Um, other questions? Any other thoughts for me? You may have to repeat it. Uh, I'm interested in the relationship between the fellows and the accessibility resources office. Is there one? Are they helpful? Are they? I mean, obviously they are, you know, they make sure that our students are accommodated, but are they helpful in a more universal way? So the Green's question has to do with the relationship between the fellows program and the Office of Accessibility Resources. And in short, there's not a direct relationship other than that the fellows are basically working with the co-chair one of the co-chairs of the work group for accessibility practices and accessibility resources as part of that work group as well. Um, I don't know that there's a clear way to connect them formally in part because a lot of accessibility, the Office of Accessibility Resources goal is accommodation. Okay. And that's important. Our goal with the fellows is to basically make their job easier so that when a test is created and sent over, it's already accessible because people are creating accessible content. Um, but I guess it'd be, there may be some ways to explore that. I think Sean's got some thoughts. Yeah, hi, Sean Moriarty here in the back of the room. 
Here you go. I'll make it easy. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So when I think of the answer to Ramin's question, I think of how we're trying to handle accessibility all over the campus. So there is this top-down initiative uh, that we talked about at yesterday's ramps session with uh, Rebecca. And in terms of how we have the accessibility, uh, the digital accessibility steering committee, that would include the people from accessibility services. And then uh, it would also include the people, the co-chairs of the work group on accessibility practices. We have the web team, library, marketing, communications, the president's office, DEI office are all involved. And then we have this bottom up initiative that we have that uh, includes the faculty fellows, the work group on accessibility practices. And really there's really, there's broad reach in that work group on accessibility practices. So, the accessibility office is uh, included in terms of that, like Patrick said, I think all of your meetings generally in terms of doing it. So there is this melding and this, uh, I think, tremendous commitment on our campus towards uh, working towards this. And I'm really happy to see, you know, the program doing so well, the faculty fellows, and now we'll be up in the mid twenties, the number that we've had. And it's it's actually been very helpful, I think, on our campus to go and to focus on that. Here you go. Please use the microphone. <laughs> well, you never know what Casey would do to my words. <laughs> so uh, the other one has to do with when we have grossly inaccessible courses, everybody suffers. So it's one of those things where when they have happened, it comes all the way to the president's office, the provost office, and everybody gets up in arms about what to do, and the faculty get indignant, upset over the fact that they're being told that the course is inaccessible. So I think it's one of those things where, you know, Sometimes it has those things have to happen in order for people to really realize how big of a big how big of an issue this is when when courses are have a lot of graphs in them, a lot of PDFs, unreadable PDFs in them, and so on. Uh, and then then you now have a, a blind student or colorblind student in your in your course, and now everything has to change. And I don't think the accessibility resources office is prepared to actually change your course. Uh, so, so I think that has to be part of the conversation. So um, Ramin, I would add to that too, that the faculty are not necessarily equipped to deal with that either. And I think that you're right to be thinking about this institutionally as well as individually, because it is true that this is a lot of work and this is additional work that we're putting on faculty, you know, and I'm really grateful for the tools and things, but to coordinate this at the institutional as well as the individual level is really gonna be key here. Because yes, one of the reasons why we've gone as far as we have is because I've never had a blind student in my classes, right? I've been lucky, right? And that changes the dynamic. And here we are at this moment where technology can really help us make get over the legal challenges as well as have more equitable classes but it is a big ask um on the individual as well as the institutional level and so you have to have a multi-prong attack but this is something that we have to i mean there's a reason why faculty get indigent about it i get it i get the defensiveness and i get the overwhelming and i am not an economist with all of those Oh my God! I I mean, and what my business colleagues were having to do, and the and the plays and all of that, there, you know, the technology isn't seamless yet, and we don't know it, and we have to be trained in it, and it is it is a big mountain. So I think you know it's right to think about how the institution can work together to prevent some of those legal challenges. And I'm gonna chime in just before I turn it over to Sean briefly. The there's an end discussion on that's in multiple levels of many on campus. And, and most recognize. And our goal from the bottom up is to 
And learn some of the simple things that can be implemented right away and just become a part of your routine. Changing everything in an existing course to make it accessible on day one is a huge win. There's been steps that various constituents on campus have tried to work on to optimize that remediation process all day. Okay. It's not perfect yet by any means. But I think creating this culture of access that we're really trying to do that Sean and Rebecca talked about yesterday, long-term will minimize that. Will we still have some faculty or staff or people that are really resistant to making it accessible or extremely resistant to changing any of their things? Unfortunately, problems. And we'll just have to manage that. But I think if we can get everybody with some of the knowledge and some of the skill set, you'll make it better long term forever. Don? So I'd say, particularly during the pandemic, we did do a lot of work to go into looking at it from a CIO point of view, like mitigate risk. And we did have a number of, uh, you know, some students, and we mitigated hundreds of courses and went in and helped faculty and worked with them. So one thing I would say is like in the end, we're a partner and I do think it's a faculty's responsibility to go and to work and to make sure that if we have uh, students that are, uh, you know, that need accommodations that we go and do it, but we don't throw them out there and do it alone, uh, you know, do it alone. We do have resources that help. It is extremely difficult for the people who are working very hard, who get faculty, who are belligerent and angry and, uh, you know, refuse to work with them. And it, so we've developed an escalation process where it largely goes back to the department chair and the dean. And then, Ramin, when it gets up to your level, it's gone through a couple levels. But I want to say, the president, yeah, the president. <laughs> but I will say that that is not the majority of people. That is hardly anyone. But like any 80-20 rule, it takes 80% of the energy. So we are also coming, as uh, like Eve mentioned, in terms of the blind students and deaf students, we are coming to a time where we actually have a number of them just this semester. And in business, uh, I, I'm thinking we have a couple of blind and a couple of deaf students. So in a way, this is, um, you know, an opportunity. Business has really uh, got together and, uh, you know, working to go and to ensure that the students, that the materials are accessible. But this also gives us a chance to, uh, you know, as we move forward, create a space for ourselves where we go and we work with these people and offer them educational opportunities. So I think we're committed to go and to have resources to help those people who are uh, working on that. And I know I saw Amy's talking about teaching assistants. I mean, there are a number of programs that we can go and look at and invest in uh, to go and to help move the program forward. And I know just briefly before that, so a fellow that was last year had an idea with some student help as well. And I talked to Sean a little bit about that. And it might move forward where, in a proactive way, there's some student help for uh, what, folks sorry. to remediate course, or course context, right? In a proactive way. Now, the, it has to be done yesterday, necessarily, but, and so we'll see. Um, it's, it's a big, big picture, and we keep chipping away at the pieces and corners, and hopefully we'll get there. So, right? I want to thank everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, we're going to stop the recording, but there is a session of five principles at one o'clock today. There are sessions at 10 a.m. and one o'clock on Wednesday. There's a session at 10 a.m. on Thursday dealing with uh, all text, and then a 10 a.m. session on Friday.
coloring maps out. Uh, if you want to know some more details, head to the session in one inbox, and then maybe one of the more specific ones later. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you.